Indeed, gracious God, you are a mighty God. You're an omnipotent God. You have created us and all that exists. Out of your love, you sent your Son in order that we might be freed from the captivity of sin, death, and the power of evil. And so, Lord, empower us to walk faithfully in your grace and mercy, and to not only walk in your mercy and goodness, but to be expressions of it through our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Creator and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. There are occasions during the church year that the text that is read, as it was this day, it simply seems a bit out of context, out of sync. After all, last Sunday, you might recall, Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration. The Mount of Transfiguration all was majestic and mighty and awesome. And that wonderful text concluded with Jesus leading the disciples down the mountain and he would begin his journey to Calvary. Today, however, as you heard in the lessons, chronologically, we back up. We back up about three years. Because in this text today, it's not a majestic text about Jesus, but Jesus, following his baptism by John in the Jordan, is being led by the Spirit out into the wilderness desert where he will be tempted by the devil. So, we might ask, what was the word of God on the Mount of Transfiguration then last Sunday? Because considering that, it helps us bring things together. The word on the Mount of Transfiguration was this, from the heavens, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. Aha, and then today, today, recall the word of God from the heavens when Jesus was baptized. This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. In both accounts, what's the commonality? What puts them together? The co commonality specifically is the identity of Jesus. The identity of Jesus as we heard, this is my son. Be it on the Mount of Transfiguration or years earlier at the River Jordan. So identity. Let's consider identity for a while. How are you identified? How would you identify others around you? Well, identity, there's many parts to it, you know. I can, you know, I can be identified, I got a lot of stuff in the pulpit here to identify with. I can be identified as a spring training fan of baseball. Some of you may consider yourself a fan as well. You might identify yourself with a team. Well then, some of you may identify yourself with, with this, a golf club. Am I starting to relate better now? A golf club. Yes, I can identify myself as a golfer. But now let's be mindful, there are many people who have clubs. They're really not golfers. <coughs> All right, well, we're not done identifying yet. So what do you think of this? My Harley vest. Look at this. It's shrunk in the last eight years, though. <laughs> but it's still a great vest. It's still a great vest. I identify with that, and it reminds me of a wonderful word that a Harley rider wrote about himself, and it speaks of identity. He said, a Harley is what I ride. It is not who I am. Returning to the text, what does our identity then have to do with Jesus and the temptations in the wilderness, or what does it have to do with the Adam and Eve account? Well, theologian Dr. Dave Losey says this regarding identity and temptation. Listen closely. When push comes to shove, all the various temptations we may encounter stem from one primary temptation, to forget who we are and therefore to forget whose we are. 
Because once you don't remember who and whose you are, you are You'll engage in all kinds of behavior to dispel the insecurities that attend your life as you are searching for that sense of security and acceptance. And so it was, you see, in the Old Testament lesson with Adam and Eve. Satan doesn't first engage them initially with temptation, but what he is doing is trying to place a little doubt in their mind about who this God really is. And so it was. When that primary relationship with God was undermined by doubt, then and only then were Adam and Eve susceptible to then forgetting or having a diminished identity with God. And when they were no longer solidly connected, they were then separating themselves from God. And we know what happened. They gave in to the temptation. They ate the apple. We know the story. Many of you have heard stories. You may have been one such person. Do you recall when moving away from the hometown or from parents, maybe to go to work or to go to school in another community? What can occur? What can occur? Well, this we know. When a person isn't grounded isn't grounded in terms of who and whose they are. They can quickly drift into a detoured life of destructive behavior in an attempt to feel acceptable by others. Have you said or heard it said, oh, so-and-so got in with the wrong crowd? You have. Well, I've told you that, you know, I'm a baseball fan, somewhat of a golfer, a biker, but this I have not told you. I'm also a country western fan. <laughs> and so I have to share some words that relate today from George Jones. I've had choices from the day that I was born. I've heard voices that taught me right from wrong. If I had listened, I wouldn't be here today, living and dying with the choices I've made. Certainly today, we don't need to take a vote as to whether there are temptations lurking around in the consciousness of our mind. After all, such is the very nature of our humanity. We confess we are by nature sinful and unclean. So think of life today. Have you ever been tempted to, for example, overdose on shopping? Be honest. It's pretty easy these days. Temptation all around. Just sign up on Amazon. And watch out if you do it at night because it's worse at night. It's just so easy to be tempted. All you have to do is push a button on the computer and the item will show up at your house at your doorstep 24 hours later and you say, wow, life is good here. However, lurking in the midst of such consumerism and marketing, if we listen too closely, if we buy in and overindulge, cert soon our identity, <coughs> excuse me, soon our identity becomes packaged and wrapped up in our culture of consumerism as we try to claim our identity by buying into our insecurities. I'm insecure, so I'm going to buy this. I'm sure I'll feel better. So also, in the Old Testament lesson, the devil tries to undermine Jesus' godly relationship by, by suggesting that Jesus may not be to secure. Come on, Jesus. If you are really Jesus, you should be able to jump off this mountain with no problem. Come on. But Jesus doesn't jump. Or come on, Jesus. You're hungry. If you're hungry, why don't you, out here in this wilderness place, why don't you turn those stones into bread? But how does Jesus respond at every turn of test and temptation? In the midst of the devil's persuasive tone, Jesus quotes scripture that undergirds God's trustworthiness. 
words in that regard of which I am reminded of and I think are powerful words for all of us in our moments of trials, testing, and temptation. To be reminded that greater is the power. Greater is the power of God that is within you and within me than the power of evil that is within the world. Indeed, amidst the testing and vulnerability of our human nature, our strength is found not simply engaging in our human resourcefulness. If we trust only in our human resourcefulness, we will be overcome. However, our security, our hope, and our peace, is it not claimed in whose we are? And where does that identity come from as regards whose we are? As with Jesus when he was baptized in the Jordan, remember again the voice of God proclaiming, you are my son, the beloved. That is your identity. So also in baptism, the words were proclaimed at your baptism. Child of God, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. I am your God. I claim you in love. Martin Luther, the founder of our Lutheran heritage, when he was suffering from doubt or demons or evil spirits, he would, all, also, excuse me, he would often proclaim, I am baptized. I am a child of God, not a child of Satan. It is said that Luther defended himself through prayer. And on one occasion in the middle of the night when he was being accosted by demons, he took the inkwell out of his desk and he threw it against the wall. And then he said, I have driven the devil away with my inkwell. Now closer to home. How many times, countless times, an infinite number of times, we have prayed the Lord's Prayer. And sometimes with great purposefulness and other times we've just glossed over it. But what have we spoken in that prayer? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You know those words as well as you know your own name. The Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Ephesians amidst testing and temptation, put on the full armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness and the shield of faith that you may be able to stand against the testing, the trials, the wiles of the devil. And so it is as we journey, and we all journey there, through the desert wilderness places of our lives, we are all spiritually vulnerable. And temptation is not only possible, it is expected. And therefore, let us affirm our full identity then in terms of both who we are and whose we are. We are children of the Most High God. We have been created in the image of God. We are meant to live for God. That is who and whose we are. And it is then we can know that temptation will not conquer. We shall be delivered from evil. For through it all, you see, it is the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God empowering us as we embrace our identity as the children of God. We are not somebodies or nobodies. We are children of God, sons and daughters of the Creator and Redeemer. And therefore, in all our days, in Jesus' name, let us claim victory amidst our vulnerabilities and let us claim triumph amidst our temptation. You are a child of God. And yes, in Christ, we are victors today and forever. Amen.